Therese is the, uh, her new book is the Dane County Farmer's Market Cookbook, Local Foods and Global Flavors. Uh, a disclaimer here, um, Kathy and I both have a quote vested interest in this book because you know when you read how how you read a testimony inside a book like this is the best book ever written says Julia Child uh, Jacques Pepin I recommend this book well Kathy and I also have our testimony uh, inscribed forever in Teresa's new book um, and so we're we're part of her book so I just wanted to give a disclaimer there but. Uh, um, Therese is the, uh, well, I call her Wisconsin's uh, food writer laureate. Uh, she's, she's an icon in Wisconsin. She's written um, scores of books and, and articles about pleasures and benefits of regional foods, sustainable cooking, and culinary folklore. And Therese, is, is this your 17th book? But, uh, it depends upon your how, how you're counting, but yeah, if you include the the uh, the the non-public, the private books, yes. Yes, I mean, when I'm in Wisconsin, I've been going to Wisconsin for vacation several times a year uh, for the last twenty years, and I'm always encountering her material, her books. So, and I've even bought them in the past, not knowing that one day I'd be meeting her like this. So this is great, and. Um, Therese has been a food columnist for Edible Medicine. Well, she's been a food columnist for so many magazines in Wisconsin. And she's, a, again, co-founder and longtime leader of the Culinary History Enthusiasts of Wisconsin in Madison. Now, Therese right now is coming to us live from Madison, the Capitol. And you can see the picture of the Capitol building. And the Farmer's Market is in Capitol Square outside the, the Farmer's Market, outside the Capitol building. It's huge. It's immense. I have been there. I'm blown away. And uh, one quick question before I give a little more of your, of your introduction, Therese. Uh, my impression was that it's the largest farmer's market in the nation. But then I hear something conflicting. It's the largest produce only farmer's market. But is it the largest or the largest produce only farmer's it's market? The largest um, producers only market in the nature in the nation. There's a lot more than produce there. Um, but all of the producers who come, uh, oh. whether it's vegetables or meats or, you know, uh, canned goods or whatever, um, they have to, the people who are there have to be, have to, it has to come from Wisconsin and they have to raise it or, or prepare it themselves. And I was just a few weeks ago where, where we go is the S Spring Green, where the American Players Theater is and Frank Lloyd Wright's home is. And they have a little nice farmer's market there. And I got some stuff there. And when I was buying some corn, I said, uh, so you grew this? She says, no, I got it from an Amish farmer. So I would rather go to, the, they had wonderful food there, but I don't know who grew what there. But I, anyway, I was blown away by, by Madison's market. It's, it's, it's a lifetime, once in a lifetime. Well, hopefully more than you go there a lot. But anyway, um, um, anyway, Therese has served for a, decade as food editor for Organic Valley Family Farms and for 15 years as a key leader of REAP Food Group, a cutting edge organization that fosters sustainable food systems in Southern Wisconsin. And she does a lot more. She's a leader in so many things. So again, I, I would like to uh, put a bushel of Therese in front of you and uh, take, it, <laughs> take it away, Therese, and serve up your bounty of food for thought. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I'm, I'm not sure who that person was that you were just talking about, but I, I, I'd like to meet her someday, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'll introduce you. She's just okay, great. great. No, thanks for having me and thanks to everybody for coming tonight. Um, it's exciting to be able to talk about really literally what is one of my favorite places on the planet, the Dane County Farmers Market. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna do some history about that first. Um, about the market itself. And um, then we are going to talk about the cookbook itself and what it means and what it has accomplished and the influence it's had on really the entire region in terms of food and cooking and agriculture. Um, and I think what I'll do is start by, for those of you who maybe have not been at the market before, I'll start with a um, a quote from the book, a little quote from the book. It's a description basically. 
just as cheese, beer, and brats come to mind when you hear Wisconsin, so does the mention of Madison conjure the Dane County Farmer's Market. The city's most celebrated event takes place on Saturday mornings beneath the majestic tree-framed state capitol dome. Shoppers stroll counterclockwise around the Capitol Square, perusing stands, tasting samples, and filling sacks and wagons with seasonal bounty. Vendors, up to 150 of them at a time in, um, that are available in high season, tout a staggering array of Wisconsin-grown produce, meats, cheeses, bakery goods, beverages, and specialty products. On Wednesdays, a second market operates between the stately government buildings located down the street from the Capitol. During the cold months of the year, the DCFM moves indoors, um, two different places. Before the ho during the holiday season, um, it goes into um, the lake-hugging Frank Lloyd Wright design Monona Terrace for what's called the holiday markets. And then after the new year, um, it moves to Garver Feed Mill, which is a handsomely renovated turn of the century event complex. Um, and that runs from January right up until the time that the market moves back outdoors to the Capitol Square. So it is indeed a year round Madison. And yes, you can eat locally throughout the year there. Indoors or outdoors, the DCFM is a unique merger of taste and place a culinary and cultural draw for shoppers, home cooks, chefs, tourists, families, breakfast lovers, photographers, foodies, university students, really anyone who eats. To be a locavore or to be a Wisconsinite to enjoy or benefit from this market. But if you are one, the DCFM will pretty much, as Scott said, blow your mind. Um, I've been going to it myself for more than 40 years um, and it's still blowing. So let's get started with a little bit of history from the market. Well, the history, the, the DCFM, the Dane County Farmers Market, um, is not the first market that operated in Madison. From the mid 1800s to early 1900s, urban farmer markets <laughs> operated, <laughs> including, okay, so it operated in various locations near the Capitol Square in downtown Madison, including one at the city market building, which is pictured here. This was built in 1909, but unfortunately it was located a little too far from the market for lasting success. It closed um, after World War I. From then on, individual family farms would occasionally set up stands near the city's limits. And some small multi-booth farm markets existed in nearby communities. But there was no large central market in place in the Madison area. By the mid 20th century, with large grocery stores and suburban malls spreading all around the nation, many municipalities had closed down their farmers markets. Indeed, across the U.S., farmers markets were few and far between until about the 1970s and 80s. That's when, spurred by a burgeoning back to the land movement and increasing consumer interest in fresh produce, they began to rise again. Madison and much of Wisconsin got back into the farmers market game in 1972, which is relatively early in the game. Um, and I think that comes as no surprise at least in, in retrospect. Um, despite its relatively cold climate, Wisconsin boasts a deep-seated culture of agriculture, one that stems from its considerable geographical diversity. The Great Lakes, um, not 10,000, but 15,000 small lakes, water lit waterways, bogs, hills, wooded areas, and rich soils that in turn offer perhaps so much of their agricultural bounty. Our strong agricultural awareness stems as well from a long history of native and immigrant heritage and expertise in both wild and cultivated food production. So in short, let's just say this, geographically, historically, culturally, Wisconsin is very much a farming state. Madison and Southern Wisconsin in particular have a strong agricultural focus because of such influences as the University of Wisconsin with its many agricultural departments and programs. And of course, nearby state government 
where legislators who represent farming districts abound. Madison is Southwestern Wisconsin's largest town. It's the urban hub that is literally and culturally fed by these various rural influences. It's also a famously progressive town with a liberal political sensibility and an early, very well-developed environmental consciousness that back in those um, hippie days helped feed the development and establishment of a new farmer's market. Madison's current market, um, named the Dane County Farmer's Market, most people think of it as Madison's Market, but it is a Dane County Farmer's Market, um, took root during 1971 and 1972 when two county extension agents, James Schrader and Ron Jensen, first began to look for a location where area growers could market their crops to urbanites. They approached shopping malls, which seemed like a natural place for a market with plenty of parking space and, well, shoppers. <laughs> but the idea was immediately met with resistance and it pretty much boiled down to this. Too messy, said mall managers. So enter Bill Dyke. Madison Mayor Bill Dyke, who had spent time at markets in Europe and was aware of the economic and cultural benefits of farmers markets. Dyke introduced Schrader and Jensen to other key players, people who were keenly interested in making one happen in Madison. One was grower um, and future Dane County executive, Jonathan Berry, who among other area farmers had been setting up his own stand now and then on city streets basically on his own and under the wire, so to speak, and who was then recruited to be market manager. At this point, Barry and Jensen further investigated possible sites, but nobody bites. Meanwhile, Mayor Dyke, favoring a central location, specifically the Capitol Square, gets Patrick Lucy involved. And with all those big wigs in the picture, uh, county extension agents, the future county executive, the mayor, the governor, things began to move faster. Final hurdles are surmounted when the Central Madison Committee, um, this is an organization whose um, mission was uh, downtown revitalization. They agreed to sponsor the market by covering trash costs and including the market in its liability insurance. And ta-da, the first market opens on Saturday, September 30th, 1972, on a Capitol Square inlet with just a handful of vendors who are quickly besieged by hundreds of produce-hungry shoppers. The following Saturday, two or more thousand customers descend on 85 vendors, so that many more vendors came, with more jumps in crowd size and the number of vendors during the rest of that short season. Any remaining doubts of the market's potential are put to rest. This is a picture of Jonathan Berry. Um, 50 years later, the first DCFN manager and the former Dane County executive. And he's speaking at the market's 50th anniversary celebration right there on the Capitol Square. He had this to say um, about the, that, that early market, that first market. He said, I vividly recall the first Dane County Farmers Market on a chilly fall morning in 1972. I worried there might be a poor start. But the notion of bringing city and county folk together with fresh produce on the square was embraced by all. One older farmer told me, don't worry, Jonathan, if the fruit is ripe, you don't have to shake the tree very hard. Clearly the fruit was ripe, but it was Barry's diligent management and, product and promotion of the market from 1972 to 1976 that was central to its early success. During the market's infancy, he and market sponsors used such strategies as limiting the market to agro products, so no crafts, um, uh, requiring a fee from vendors so that there was financial support, and creating a growers council to represent the interests of the vendors. Barry also quickly lengthened the market's summer fall only season, starting it in spring to allow the selling of early season crops and bedding plants, and thus increasing the DCFM's allure and usefulness to both growers and buyers. He also added a Wednesday midweek market to the Saturday's only schedule. 
In these first years, the DCFM is largely the only place that area residents can buy farm fresh products direct from the farmers. By and large, these were staples, crops like apples and potatoes and tomatoes. But as the numbers of vendors increased, so did the variety of available foodstuffs. From 1976 to 1979, when melon growers Judy and Dan Peterson served as co-managers of the market, the advisory council began to evolve into a governing body. The Wednesday market matured, settled into its primary role, which it remains today as a mid-morning to mid-afternoon venue for downtown workers, especially those toiling away in nearby government buildings. During this time, the market size increases, increases both in customers and in, vendor, and in vendors. This is also the time frame um, when Odessa Piper, an early um, bakery vendor there at the market and the chef proprietor of the fledging and eventually nationally renowned La Toile restaurant, began basing her menus on market ingredients. Uh, over time, Piper's influence became a dynamic factor in the market's success and her culinary model involved into a regional movement of farm to table dining. Former egg vendors, Joe and Paul Proust take the reins from 1980 to 1983. During their tenure, the organization gained not-for-profit status and established clear, clear definitions for membership, uh, for what types of uh, products could be used or be allowed to be sold and for handling rule violations. Vendors, for instance, are now required to participate in the production of their foodstuffs, in other words, no buy and sell. So Scott, when you mentioned before, is it the largest farmer's market? No, but it's the largest farmer's market that grows local produce and, and it doesn't do the buy and sell thing that some other markets do. The other increasing, the ever increasing size and scope of the market parallels moves towards self-government. Market overseers grapple with uh, food sampling issues and inspection of vendors and excessive traffic on the capital lawns. The DCFM is definitely growing up at this point. During the Mary Walters years, 1984 to 1989, peak season Saturday markets featured about 150 vendors and saw crowds of 10,000 shoppers. Walters is the first manager who's not a vendor. She's a former meat grader her education and her experience and served her well for the health and safety considerations that had become necessary with the increase of many value added foods at the market. So jams, relishes, vinegars, pesto, pasta, as well as fresh trout, frozen meats and other goods now must satisfy rigorous checks. During this time, the DCFM officially became independent from its original sponsors and its board of directors, very importantly, crafts a mission statement, one that steers the market goals for the next decades, right up until now. Um, the market now, because of those that mission statement, officially supports Wisconsin growers, crops and products, the health and welfare of area eaters, agricultural and culinary education, and strengthening urban rural connections. So it was very much about the vendors first, but it was also about the community and about the community of eaters and shoppers um, and about their health and, and welfare too. Throughout the 1990s, the market is run by grower and educator, Mary Carpenter, with assistance from her husband, Quentin. Her first major, major hurdle is to see the market through a traffic congestion controversy. Things had gotten so busy that the Capitol Police uh, and um, the, the city police were very concerned about it and it became quite a controversy. The market is so busy that litter and lawn trampling are also a problem. Indeed, the congestion is so bad that it threatens the mar market's location on the square. I can remember the newspaper articles and the letters to the editors during that time frame and and people were just up in arms about the possibility that the market would get moved from the square because it was so busy. After a series of efforts to resolve the issue, solutions propo proposed by the city, uh, including the suspension of bus traffic around the square during market hours and things like uh, trash control measures and the, the assignment of Capitol Police to market security, well, they, they, they do the trick. 
Um, the, the DCFM is back on track, the controversy is over, and things are going at top speed as ever. Indeed, when the DCFM sellers roster hits 400, the organization establishes is pretty much forced to establish a membership cap of 300, plus a waiting list for new vendors. During these years, national and regional media gets on the DCFM bandwagon too, giving the market a lot of attention among the best in the nation. Mong fam farming families during this time who are making a new life in Wisconsin diversify the market and enrich the region's culinary culture. Organic produce, heirloom and hydroponic vegetables, fresh flowers, grass-fed meats, and an ever-growing array of new crops and products increase in popularity. During this time, the DCFM matures into a force locally, regionally, and nationally. So um, in the first three years of the 21st century, husband and wife Bill Warner and Judy Hegeman lead the market. Amid the September 11 um, terrorist attack crisis, they announced that the market will become fully year round, outdoors on Wednesdays and Saturdays, both around and near the Capitol Square and indoors um, at the end of the year during the holiday markets and the winter markets that are held again from January until April when the market goes back outdoors. So a full year round market, which is also unusual around the nation. Hageman and Warner established a very popular weekly market breakfast, a community social event that highlights local crops and products while teaching shoppers how to use the cold season bounty. Area restaurateurs showcase their skills at the breakfast and the relationship between local chefs and the farmer's market flourishes. At this point, the outdoor Saturday market is the largest farmer's market in the country that sells only regionally grown products, uh, crops and products. It also requires producers attendance at their stands, which is so important to the educational and community building nature of the market. At this time, about 30 smaller satellite markets, um, they're, they're independent from the Dane County Farmers Market, are kind of like a um, uh, one of those business uh, incubators because many of those people then go on to become members of the Dane County Farmers Market too, but they're also around the city and around the region as satellite markets. 20, 2003 to 2014 are the Larry Johnson years. A geologist and flower grower, Johnson was the market's full, first full-time manager and he's the one who has held the position the longest. During his tenure, ready-to-eat frozen or canned foods made with regional ingredients hit the market scene, including things like ravioli and, and pasties and soups, mini quiches and pizza. It was also a time of much national media coverage about the market, including articles in the New York Times, Huffington Post, National Geographic, et cetera, et cetera. Local media also ran columns featuring market vendors, like me. <laughs> I mean, not me like the vendor, but I did write a column during that time um, and featured local crops and products and vendors and recipes. And there also was a book published called The Dane County Farmer's Market, A Personal History, written by uh, Mary Carpenter, one of the former vendors. Odessa Piper, now an acclaimed James Beard award-winning celebrity in the food world, sells L'Etoile to the restaurant chef to cuisine, Tori Miller, in 2005. Tori, along with a growing number of area chefs, makes his own market, the DCFM, and furthers the goal of a regionally reliant food system. The influence of area chefs on the evolution of the market and on the local foods movement is now significant. More restaurants are listing suppliers on their menus, which helps drive everyday buyers to the market. Chefs request specialty produce and products from vendors, and vendors respond by growing or producing them. In turn, Vendors often new crops and products that motivate chefs to use them. The diversity of foodstuffs, vendors, and buyers continues to grow, and this is a dynamic that keeps the DCFM at the forefront of markets nationwide. In 2008, the market weathers a tanking economy, 
and sidewalk construction all around the square. Neither seems to have slowed anything down much. 2010, there is a vendor waiting list of five years, rivaling as many Madisons like to point, Madisonians like to point out the waiting list for season tickets to Green Bay Packer games. Average attention, uh, uh, attendance is now 18,000 per week and the top turnout to date is 25,000. In 2011, Southern Wisconsin now boasts 45 farmers markets. Statewide, the total is 231, and that's um, behind only California and New York. Indirectly connected to the DCFM are other notable initiatives that occur during this time, including the formation of the Dane County Food Council, so food gets political, local and statewide eat local challenges, an annual food and sustainability Sustainability Festival sponsored by the groundbreaking Farm to Table organization REAP Food Group, state focused annual local food summits, annual local food summits, and the spiking growth of community supported agriculture. Farm to Table dining is clearly feeling its oats during these years. And with tourists now a large part of the market scene, the next two market managers, Bill Lubing from 2014 to 2016, and Sarah Elliott from 2016 to 21 worked to foster a view of the market as an entity uh, beyond tourism. It's almost like there's two markets. Um, there's the morning, early morning market where all the, the shoppers come with their bags and their, their uh, wagons and really do their grocery shopping. Um, and then there's the tourists who come and will buy a few things but aren't there for so much for grocery shopping. Um, but what Elliot, both Elliot and uh, Lubing were really trying to press was this um, place, a place where the community can gather, where it can do its grocery shopping, where it can sustain a direct connection with the people who grow, raise, and make their food. Local newspapers publish articles about the increase in food choices at the market over the years, the diversity of its customers, farmers, and producers, and the growing number now of second and third generation vendors at the market. The most challenging period in DCFM history begins in early 2020, as the world reels at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Manager Sarah Elliott launches a drive-through outdoor market that uses online pre-ordering and operates in shifts. The outbreak social restrictions Restrictions are a major blow to the DCFM. Attendance, local foods access, the livelihood of members and growers, and the market's beloved personal connections all suffer. There's no food sampling, no music, no community nonprofit tables, and no bathrooms. Masks, social distancing, and a strict safe shopper code of conduct are now the order of the day. The DCFM works with public officials to develop a safe, efficient model that continues to connect customers and members while also meeting ever-changing public health requirements throughout the crisis. Within just a few months, the market is able to add a walk-up shopping option um, and it launches an emergency farmer fund to help the organization's member navigate pandemic disruptions. Around the region, some growers and producers switch to home delivery or to neighborhood pickups or CSA arrangements and, and other business models to stay afloat. Some retire altogether. Still, like the Dane County Farmers Market, most farmers markets in the region remain open, maintaining critical sales opportunities for local producers and even strengthening the farm to table vendor customer relationship as both sides grieve the loss of more direct content, contact. The pandemic alters the market's course, but along with 9,000 other farmers markets across the country, including about 300 in Wisconsin, the DCFM helps fill gaps in the food chain caused by pandemic related shutdowns, offers eaters an alternative to shopping indoors at grocery stores and responds to a new surge of interest in local foods. By June of 2021, with pandemic restrictions loosening, the market is back in business at the Capitol Square. On the first Saturday, some 100 booths and about 20,000 eager shoppers attend. 
The relief, I was there, the relief and joy are absolutely palpable. This is very important to me, to me because it's my living, says vendor Gretchen Kroost in a Wisconsin State Journal piece. It means we have some semblance of order again. The same article quotes longtime pesto producer Mark Olson. This is home to me. This is my family. This is my community. By 19, uh, by excuse me, by 2022, market attendance is back to pre-pandemic numbers, and there are 35 vendors on the membership waiting list. Not only has it survived, but the DCFM is thriving again. Indeed, uh, last year, 2022, also marked the DCFM's 50th anniversary, with special committees managing a number of events and initiatives to celebrate the milestone, including this little number the Dane County Farmer's Market Cookbook, Local Foods, Global Flavors, published in July of 2023 and written by yours truly. And that, my friends, brings us to the present. <laughs> um, and um, the, the, the Dane County Farmer's Market Cookbook is uh, a, a, an initiative um, of the 50th anniversary. Um, now that I've uh, pummeled you with history of the market itself, I also wanna tell you a little bit about this new chapter um, of the Dane County Farmers Market and what I've been involved with basically for the last two years of my life. Um, I wish I could say that it was my idea <laughs> to do this cookbook. Um, and in a way it almost was because back in 1992 when I was a fledging food writer, I did wanna write a book about the Dane County Farmers Market. I, I Even though that was 30 years ago, um, I could see how much it meant to the city and how important it was to agriculture and culture in, in our region of the world. Um, and it just fascinated me. And I was going every week. I had been a chef uh, for years before that, um, buying uh, produce at the, at the market. And I really wanted to dig deeper. Um, they didn't really, at that point, because I uh, a freelancer, um, they were hesitant to have anyone um, earn money or make money from the name of the Dane County Farmers Market. Um, and so, and also my book kind of, um, that book kind of evolved into a book about farmers markets around the state. But, um, you know, I was keeping that Dane County Farmers Market story in the back of my mind too. And what happened was, um, I guess, you know, jump to 30 years later, uh, at the very beginning of 2023, the very beginning of it, it was the first market after the holidays. And I was um, approaching my friends, uh, Joan and Ted Balwig, who are pepper um, uh, producers uh, at the farmer's market, very well known. They've been there since very early on. Um, and we had known each other for years. And we had, of course, often talked uh, when we were at the market together. And this time they kind of signaled me over and I knew something was up. And they said, they told me that the, that the um, board of directors of the Dane County Farmers Market was looking for projects to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of the market. And Ted said, you know, we think that there should be a cookbook and we think you should write it. What do you think? And I said, I think yes. <laughs> so that's pretty much how that happened. It was kind of a slam dunk for me. Um, it was their brainchild, and we did then form a committee, the three of us, uh, with me as the project leader and eventually the writer of the book. Um, it, it very much seemed like, uh, you know, just the right time and place to do this. We wanted to celebrate the history of the market and how it had grown from this tiny little, you know, um, uh, potatoes and tomatoes and just a few vendors into hundreds of vendors hundreds of thousands of people each year. Um, and we felt like we we really needed to have a cookbook. There are lots of farmer's market cookbooks out there. I started to go to Amazon the other day to see just how many farmer's market and farm to table cookbooks there are now. <laughs> and I just gave up. I mean, it's just there was hundreds of pages of them. Um, but we felt like it was time for us to do our own. And so we formed a committee and started setting our goals and we took it from there. Um, the main goals of uh, the project were, like I said, to celebrate the market and the growth and influence of the market, um, to honor the community that had helped it grow, um, the shoppers, the vendors, the chefs, et cetera. 
We also wanted to deepen that commitment to seeing the farmer's market more as a grocery shopping place and not just a place for maybe, you know, a, a bag of tomatoes and a cup of coffee. Um, we wanted also the book to um, contain uh, recipes that were, were deeply delicious and um, enjoyable to make and really would spur people to cooking from farmers, farm fresh produce. Um, and so we felt like we had to have a theme where there's all these farmer's market cookbooks out there and most of them um, do the seasonal thing, you know, start with spring, summer, fall. And what we wanted to do was something just a little bit different. We, we, we felt like, um, uh, you know, people are pretty much convinced now how great farmer's markets can be. But we really wanted to point up not just that there's, um, you know, things in season there, but that there are things you can use throughout the year. Um, that the, the market season is really, really every season, so to speak, so that you can go in season and buy the in season corn and tomatoes and onions and, and on and on. But you can also go throughout the year and eat the meats and buy the meats and the fish and the eggs and the dairy products, the cheese, of course, in Wisconsin, and all of the specialty products and value added products that are now being sold at both the Dane County Farmers Markets and of course, so many other markets now around the world too. So we came up with an idea and it was Ted's idea. He's got lots of good ideas. And the idea was to emphasize buying local foods, buying local ingredients, but giving them a global spin, giving them international flavor. So what we did is um, we said, we, we set up some rules for submitting recipes. We said it should feature something from the market or some things from the market, but it should have some kind of global spin, maybe an ethnic recipe from your family or community, um, maybe something from your travels or from what you read in cookbooks or see on um, food television, um, or what just inspired you to create something new at the market that had something of an international spin. And um, we began then to find you know, people to help us do that. Um, so we gathered our resources. We found photographers, recipe testers, marketing help, readers, copy editors, and of course a publisher. And the thing I wanna point out is that almost all of these people are volunteer because all of the proceeds for this cookbook go back to the market. So it's not just a celebration of the market, um, and the food at the market, it's also um, a sustaining um, uh, finance for the market too. Let's see, let me get into a new slide here. We started with the vendors for collecting recipes. We wanted this to be a community cookbook, but a community cookbook that was um, uh, about the entire community. So the first thing we did is we went out to vendors. We started in April of last year and I basically pounded the pavement every week, telling them about the book, asking them to submit their recipes that again, used local ingredients with global flavors. Um, and then we moved on to um, shoppers and chefs and really the entire community. Um, and uh, so that went on for about three, four months of just collecting recipes. As for the structure of the book, um, I kind of mentioned that before, we really wanted a mix of things. We wanted uh, not just the, the staples, but all of these different kinds of products that you can find at the market now all throughout the year. Everything from kimchi and sauerkraut to exotic eggplants and lanjäger. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but that's a specialty um, uh, meat sausage um, sold at the farmer's market and at many taverns in Wisconsin. Things like lard and beans, et cetera, et cetera. Harissa paste, kimchi, pestos, hummus, tamales, all of those. Um, so we were looking for recipes that would utilize some of these ingredients and be um, expressed in global recipes. The food itself in the book, the recipes themselves, um, well, um, we were, I don't really exactly know what to call this kind of food, but the, the word that came to mind for me for the book was called pan populous. And that means that it's people food. It's not frou-frou, high-end vertical food. It's good home cooking with a very, with kind of broadened and brightened by global flavors. So it's things like um, stuffed jalapenos or a marvelous stew from Livia 
or jambalaya or this uh, on the left of your screen, this um, this wonderful drink created by uh, a chef here in Madison. He's called This is a Spicy Drink. He was, uh, he was his name is Gil Altschul, and he was very much inspired by lemon uh, drop peppers, a new variety of peppers he had never tried before. And he invented this drink um, with a very spicy Mexican flavor to honor it. So I think I will hold it there. Maybe let me tell you, let, let me do one more thing here and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, I wanna just speak to briefly to um, one aspect, one more aspect of the, of the market. And this is the Dane County farmers market, but it really is about all farmers markets everywhere. And that's the, the, the market as a, as a third place, as a community place, as a place with a lot of people power and connection. And I'm just gonna read, to finish up, I'm just gonna read to you from the book. Um, um, uh, this is in the introduction, I believe, uh, speaking to that community aspect of farmer's markets. The market isn't just a place where food is bought and sold. It's a community of people who depend on each other for livelihood or sustenance, yes, but also for conversation and networking, for sharing recipes and growing tips, for kinship. When we asked contributors to th share their stories from the market, it was no surprise that many of their tales were about people connections. Longtime shopper Natasha Merton told us about the day that she returned to the market after being out of town for three weeks. She said, I literally got shouted at by three different vendor friends who asked me where I had been and how I could not have let them know. They had been seriously concerned, she wrote. I will, do, now I will not do that again, but instead I will now tell them all the unnecessary details about my travels. I can sympathize with her because I've been going to that market, like I said, for 40 years. And I like to go when it's really early. I like to go when you know there's time to chat with the vendors. But you should just hear the ribbing when I arrive in and later than about seven o'clock in the morning, I get constant comments about, oh, you overslept ho, or somebody else was out, somebody was out late again last night. Market regular um, Kristen Korovec's favorite market memory is from her wedding day. And yes, she and her soon to be husband made time for the DCFM even on that momentous morning. She says, Larry Haas, the gourd guy, he's the guy who sells these beautiful giant gourds at the market, presented us with a giant knotted gourd signifying our marriage, she told me. And this reminded me of another story that I heard years ago from former meat vendors, John and Dorothy Prisky. This time the gift giving went the other way across the vendor table. Two faithful early morning customers after having their usual chat with the Priskies, went home and baked a pie with seasonal apples that they had just purchased, purchased at the market. Then they packed it up, still warm, drove back to the market and presented it to John and Dorothy. This kind of care for each other is not unusual. I've seen customers purchase donuts and coffee for vendors too busy to leave their stand for breakfast and shoppers who stand in for a seller while the latter takes a break. I've watched growers weigh up pears, tell the customer the amount due, and then add a few more pieces of fruit to the bag. Sometimes the market camaraderie becomes habitual, even ritualized. Retired Dane County employee Christine Liddell passed along how she and other workers from a downtown government building used to gather regularly at the nearby Wednesday market, searching for a little sunshine break and some fresh ingredients for a shared lunch. Christine told us, the rules provided that we'd walk across, we'd walk twice around the market, perusing the best ingredients and then buying on the second go around. Then she said, we'd meet in the lunchroom and individually design our grilled cheese, awaiting our turn to use the sole grill. We would brag to each other about the cross hatch design that we were able to get on our sandwiches. Many a county employee would walk down the first floor, wondering from where that fabulous smell emanated. Gift giving, remembering birthdays, pitching in, sharing rituals, even practical jokes. These are what create bonds at the farmer's market. Linked to what we eat and cook, they are ties that nurture community 
in a particularly elemental way. I'm reminded of the term third place, the one coined by um, sociologist Ray Oldenburg to, um, he used it to label public gathering places such as restaurants and bars, places that he argued are as central to human well-being as home and workplace. I believe that the Dane County Farmers Market is a vitally important third place in the region. Furthermore, I take heart in knowing that there are now going on 9,000 farmers markets operating around the country. That's thousands of third places where people can access high quality, healthful food, bolster regional agricultural, agriculture and economies, and just plain have a good time together. These community strengthening settings are especially significant in the years following a pandemic when so many third places were taken from us. Good food builds bridges from farm to table, from market to community, and as the cookbook hopefully illustrates from recipe to world. When we connect the dots, we recognize not only that everyone eats, but everyone sits at the same table too everyone belongs. I'm going to close here with one more picture. Can you see that one? Yeah. So that's just the front and back cover of the book. And there are two testimonials from the most illustrious testimonial writers <laughs> that we had from the book. <laughs> so thank you, Scott. And thank you, Catherine, um, for the testimonials and for inviting me tonight. Thank you so much, Therese. And I can't, I feel like I got some kind of award by being asked to give uh, <laughs> testimony for your book. And I think Kathy feels the same way. Uh, I, I show people, look, I mean, I've had all kinds of articles published and everything, but but this is one of my highlights here being being uh, put in there like that. So thank you for, for the invitation to do that. Uh, I did have, I'll start off with a question and then Kathy will read the uh, chat questions, but uh, is there any, you have such beautiful profiles. One of the key ingredients of your book are the profiles, the humanity of the, the people who, who sell the stuff, the, the farmers, uh, the international array. Uh, are, are there any one or two little stories that really stand out to you about, about some of these, uh, these farmers? Well, um, it's it they they I love the um well it's not just the farmers you know it's the shoppers too uh, the the same the similar kind of yes. connections and stories happen um you know with the people that you're shopping with as with the vendors and the thing that immediately comes to mind is there's a chef that I know his name is Eric Rupert um he we worked together for many years at the Ovens of Brittany restaurants he went on to um, become the chef de cuisine at Litchfall. And uh, then into started his own business. He's just done amazing things, but he still comes to the market at about the same time that I do. And um, he has this little ritual where he tries to steal my mark my cart <laughs> when I'm not looking, which just cracks me up. Um, but no, there's people like John and Dorothy Prisky, who I mentioned, they're former vendors. And, you know, just became good friends, um, people who you talk to, you know, you you may only see them once a week, you may not socialize with them otherwise, you know, outside of the market, but they are people who really, you really have a connection to. And, um, you know, I miss so many of those vendors um, who are no longer either with us or there at the market, new ones coming in all the time, new friendships coming in. Um, and um, it's 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 a place that it's kind of like this is going to sound funny, but it's like church to me. It's like synagogue or church to me. It's what renews me every week. Um, uh, and I have to go. I mean, Friday nights, <laughs> Friday nights, I got to be, you know, home and at bed at, by eight o'clock or nine o'clock so I can get up at 530 and be there at church. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. And I think one of the most nutritious, delicious ingredients of the farmer's market in Madison is meeting the farmers and the beautiful sense of camaraderie and joy of everyone there. It's community. It's it's what humans need. So right. and, and thank you for capturing all that in your book. And I'm not just saying this to give puff to it. I think 
it's masterfully written, constructed, designed. The recipes are wonderful. Oh, and there are recipes with, with the notice that we sent out to everybody. If, if you can look at that, there are links to the recipes in the book and there's a sampling. Well, like you see here, there's a sampling of the book. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy who will, will toss you all these questions. Take care. Thank you, Scott. And I actually really did read your book before I wrote anything. <laughs> so I, I'm like, I take it seriously. <laughs> I don't, you know, and then, you know what? The best part was it was a good book. You know, if it wasn't a good book, it would be a tough, tough haul. You know, it was excellent. And I learned about Concord Grapes, the history of that, which I sloppily did not know before. <laughs> um, Sarah Gavick said, do they limit the number of vendors selling certain items? Like, for example, uh, popcorn vendors? No, as far as I know, there is no limit. Um, uh, there aren't that many popcorn vendors out there. So that one in particular is not a problem. You will see over time um, uh, some trends. Right now, there are more meat vendors than we've ever had before. I'm not quite sure what that's about. Um, but it's that the mix is pretty democratic. Um, the base is, as it's always been, uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, produce, um, the basics, um, but also lots of variations within those basics. Um, and then there's always been cheese. Um, we have, you know, I think uh, probably about eight or 10 cheese vendors. And some of them are, you know, world famous cheeses, cheese makers. Um, so, uh, but then, the value added products, there's a good mix of that. So as far as I know, there is no, there is no shuffling of what type of thing. I think that there might be in the bakery realm because bakery, bakery was added very early on in the market's history um, as a way both to lure people and to feed people while they're there. And so not all of those, not of course the bakers who are making those bakery products are not growing the wheat themselves. Um, are not growing the berries themselves. In some cases they are, um, but they they are more and more now buying from the vendors themselves. So um, yeah, there's a good mix and there's no official that I know of, there's no official um, uh, sorting of types. By the way, were the Hmong there, were they Hmong there at the beginning of the market or is that something that came later? No, not at the beginning because they really didn't start coming to the U.S. Uh, until after the Vietnam War. They were fleeing, they were refugees from the Vietnam War because they had supported American troops. And um, three states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and I'm forgetting the third one, it might be Michigan, um, were the first states to welcome them through mostly through churches um, and to help them settle in um, in the U.S. And they come from a very um, agricultural focus, very agriculture centric um, culture, very uh, um, experienced um, both historically and as families um, growing food. And so it was natural for them to be farmers here also and to come to the farmers markets. And I, I got so many fun stories about, you know, how they first started coming really with things that were that they that 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 could be grown here and that were grown here, cucumbers and tomatoes, etc. But bit by bit they started adding their own types of produce, bitter bitter melons and lemongrass and different kinds of herbs and hot peppers, things that we didn't recognize, but just like every immigrant group uh, that comes into the US, the same thing happened with the Hmong in Madison, which is those ingredients and some of that culinary culture became part of our culinary culture. Interesting, by the way, uh, Mr. Flick said, was complimentary of your English. He said, thank you for properly pronouncing restaurateur without an N. I, I did it <laughs> right too. How about my pronunciation of Wisconsin? <laughs> well, what I'm a little bit worried was I was going to say it wrong, trying to, <laughs> trying to reflect his comments. So does anybody have a question that they would like to ask? Maybe put your Should hand up or something? 
Should I do the stop share here? I'll, I'll stop the share. Is, is that all right? Oh, yes, please. Um, and then we can, everybody can be, there we go. Wow, look at all of you. <laughs> yes. Cynthia, do you have a question? Yes, though? No? Uh, I'm going to give it to her anyway. She always asks a question. Go ahead, ask a question. I've asked you to unmute. <laughs> no, you're you're yeah. still muted. Oh. Uh, Cynthia, we're not, uh, since I put you on the slide, um, you haven't unmuted yet. I see, I have to unmute. Okay. Yes. It, it was delightful fun seeing it. I've only been up there a couple of times because it's kind of a long haul for your grocery shopping, but it's impressive and it's really nice to see it captured like this. Cynthia, it's good to see you. Cynthia has been up to speak at CHU, the Culinary History Enthusiasts of Wisconsin. I don't know, maybe three or four times with your yeah. books. Yeah, wonderful. Thank When's you. The next yeah, <laughs> nice to well, see you. I'm working on the proposal for the next one now, so, right. so taking notes frantically as you're speaking. Uh, Donna <laughs> Marsic, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. One. Okay, go cool. Good, good, good. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Donna Marsick said, I enjoy the Chew, uh, enjoyed Chew, which is the culinary history enthusiast of Wisconsin, during my 29 years living in Columbus, Wisconsin, on a small farm. Therese, I have many fond memories of the extraordinary Dane County farm market on the square in Madison. We lived next to a truck farmer who brought his amazing sweet corn and other vegetables to the market every week. My little Montana town, I hope that's right, uh, has a small farm market, which I enjoy, but it's nothing like Madison. Mm -hmm. That's sad it, when you get used to yeah. such a bounty. Yeah, it is. It's bounteous. It's beautiful. There's so many things about it. I, you know, all farmers markets to me are wonderful. I, I have to say that I pretty much wrap a lot of my life around not just the DCFM, but other satellite markets in Madison. And when I travel, that's what I do. I we like to, um, you know, we like to get an Airbnb, and and instead of going to the grocery store or to a restaurant, we go to the farmers markets. We buy the local ingredients and bring them back and cook what we can from them and learn what we can from them. I really have that kind of uh, lens of food, if you will, around learning about the world through through its food. And the farmer's market is the per per perfect place to do that. And I think if you come to Wisconsin, if you come to Madison and you see the beauty of, of the Dane County farmer's market, the setting, the spectacular setting, it's just gorgeous. The um, It's tree lined with these giant trees and there's the Capitol Square and so much color, so much flavor. Um, and it's, Surpri it never surprises me. It never ceases to surprise me how, you know, it's a community. It this is it's not a little market. Um, it's a big market, and yet that sense of community is still there. Uh, Sarah inquires, what do you foresee as the future of the market, especially new community initiatives? Good question. That's a good question. And I don't know if I can answer that one because I'm not actually part of the Dane County Farmers Market. I can tell you what I would like to see. I really would like to see, um, uh, you know, more um, a way a way to in a way to um, both use the tourism. It is a tourist attraction now and um, and has been for years. And like I said earlier in the talk, there's almost two markets. There's the shoppers market and there's the tourist market. Um, there is some, you know, mix, of course. And we have so many other satellite markets that people will go to if they don't want to be at the busy market. Um, but what I'd really like to see is maybe less of the coffee cup and pastry and more of the filled wagons and um, bags. And that's what I hope that the market can continue to work on is finding ways. Um, for example, here's what one farmer did that I thought was just genius. Um, they're dairy farmers and um, uh, meat farmers and they, uh, they have their milk made into yogurt, but it's not yogurt for cooking, which would be hard for a tourist to take home. What a tourist does want as they're walking around a farmer's market is something to drink, something healthy to drink. So they came up with a yogurt drink that uses local fruits in it 
and it's you know it's a perfect solution. So I'd like to see more um, innovation around what it is that tourists can buy more of, and how can we fill those bags and wagons more, um, uh, um, and and have people do grocery shopping at the farmers market. We want these the farmers who are at the market. It's really about continuing to have a place where they can make a living selling what they grow and produce. So whatever we can do, we should do to help that. Uh, Debbie Pope inquired, has the market ever offered cooking classes? Yes, um, there, were, uh, there were some years where cooking classes were offered. They're not really classes, they were demonstration with demonstration cooking. Um, and there was, um, uh, during the market breakfast years, that that market eventually moved to another location where there were restaurants and so um, the market breakfast is ending. But they used to also provide recipes from um, those winter market items. So things like hydroponics and stored over vegetables and you know more proteins, eggs and cheeses and meats. Uh, and they would the chefs would come up with a menu uh, and recipes that would be um, that would utilize the winter produce. And that was just a wonderful educational time. So um, yes, there, there have been nothing going on right now, as far as I know, as far as culinary classes. So that breakfast that you were having at the market, that's mm -hmm. moved elsewhere or it's just- It had to food. stop because that was at the, Madison Senior Center for years that's where that's where the that's where the winter market in other words the market that went from January to April um, that's where that first operated and stayed for a number of years and then it eventually moved to Garver Feed and Garver Feed Mill is a, a restaurant and food complex kind of like a, um, a meeting or conference type place um, event center and so there are restaurants in that building. And uh, so that's what people now, and that's what people go to to eat, that the market does not, they don't have a facility for the market to cook. Now, there. is is Nick Mink involved with that? Mm, with Garver Fee? Yeah, no, he's no, doing Nick something Mink, else. Nick Mink moved on from um, Sitka Salmon, if that's what you're talking about. Right. And he is now the owner operator of uh, um, Seven Acre Dairy in Paoli, which is south of southwest of uh, Madison. It's a small community, but very local foods oriented. And it's a uh, um, uh, both a an Airbnb, not Airbnb, but a, um, a boutique hotel, hotel and a restaurant. And they also um, are connected to several to a cheesemaker and to several other producers, so they have a market there. So that's something that he's been doing and opened about a year ago, I believe. Yeah, because I see the post from time to time, but I wasn't quite sure the proximity. I I I, I bet you've been there. Mm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago was the last time. Oh, it's absolutely. a beautiful place. Beautiful. I mean. It, they took an old cheese factory and renovated it um, and built this beautiful boutique hotel in it with, like I said, with a restaurant and it's right along the Sugar River. It's just a gorgeous setting. And basically that town now has turned into the most marvelous weekend place for the rural and urban areas around it. Uh, and, you know, it's filled every weekend on Saturday, Sunday with music and you know, there's a cheese factory and there's this wonderful um, brewery and the seven acre dairy and restaurants. It's a it's a wonderful place to visit. Excellent. Who knew? Uh, by the way, and this is a not exactly the market related, but I remember when I was a kid, we would go up to Wisconsin and we would go to the various cheese making places and you could watch it, you know, the curds and everything, the big tubs. Is that still possible or is that that's diminished now. Oh yeah, it's um, still a big part of um, um, uh, you know agricultural tourism. Um, the term for you know combining things like cheese cheese making with people watching cheese making. Um, yes, that is. There are many places in Wisconsin, many cheese factories, and many farms that offer farm tours or you know um, pet the 
pet the cow types of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, mazes, you know, corn mazes. Yes, that combination of agriculture and tourism is very big in our state. Oh, excellent. Because I, I somewhere I just got the impression from some comments that that was no longer possible. That's thrilling because I'd like to do that. Um, I think we've done it with the questions. I think you did such a complete um, presentation. There wasn't much left to ask, which is great. Hey, Scott, I'm turning it over to you. I must say there's one thing that bothers me about your talk, Therese. Um, I, I'm from Chicago. I'm third generation. But as I say, I do spend a lot of time in Wisconsin. And uh, I'm missing Wisconsin right now. Uh, <laughs> You just like, got back from Spring Green. <laughs> who did? You, you did, did, didn't you? Yes, I just got back, and I'm I'm missing all the and and the farmers markets and everything, and and that beautiful beautiful state that you're so much a part of. So uh, so you you wet my appetite for it, and you really gave a, a I loved your talk, and you gave such a great full buffet of 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 everything there you captured i think gave a real taste of wisconsin and madison with that so thank you so much and remember sometime i i know where i stay is what's about 45 minutes from madison so sometime if if you're not gallivanting around and i'm in madison you know uh i want to take you out to lunch at the spring green general store with their great quiche and stuff so anyway so here's an open invitation and we'll be in touch so i hope to actually meet you one day in in wisconsin and we will do that yes and enjoy where you live it's it's a great great place so you take thank care. thank you thank you scott thank you everyone thank you bye-bye good night